in chat. I am Kendra Little from Redgate's database DevOps advocate team. And I wanted to do a live stream and talk about a term that I am very surprised to have just learned today, but I'm, I'm pretty excited about it too. The term is database reliability engineering. I'm also trying out a new little experiment here with the Microsoft Whiteboard. So I'm using the Microsoft Whiteboard app and sharing my screen. And I thought this would be a fun thing to just map out why I think this is an interesting uh, term and talk a little bit about what it means. So you'll see me uh, playing around with the Microsoft Whiteboard as we go. But so where does this term come from? The database reliability engineering term. I just heard about this today. I saw about this. I saw this term on a session title from Hamish Watson. Uh, so I want to say props to Hamish, otherwise known as the hybrid DBA on Twitter. And he put in a session to the Data Grillin conference that's happening in 2020. Uh, I think it's end of May in Germany. It's a fantastic conference. And his session is about, you know, is this the future of DBAs? Is database reliability engineering what the database administrator role is turning into? Now, I don't think that Hamish uh, coined this term because there is a book on this that was co-authored by Charity Majors. Um, I don't know if she's even the main author of the book, but I know Charity Majors because she does well, she does really cool uh, podcasts and webinars, and she's kind of famous from her take about testing and production and the evolution of databases. So there's this whole O'Reilly book that Charity Majors co-wrote on database reliability engineering that's from 2017, right? I've been missing out for a little bit in terms of this concept. And I actually think, um, from what I can tell from a bit of searching, this term database reliability engineering I mean, it's a play on uh, site reliability engineering. So SRE or site reliability engineering is not a new term at all. And it's got a bunch of free resources for site reliability engineering out there. Um, Google has this SRE, uh, not STRE, but SRE handbook and online, lots of free stuff. And they've got some really interesting points in there about site reliability engineering, including things like if you have management who's arguing for things like we need to have, you know, guarantee 100% uptime and we need to set our SLAs in these ways, they make some points in that book why setting zero downtime targets actually, uh, the handbook, I mean, setting zero downtime targets are not actually the best way to necessarily minimize your downtime. So they have uh, interesting points in there from work that they've done and things that they've studied. And of course, database reliability engineering is about similar concepts, but you know, applied to the database, of course. So you know, I am very thankful to Hamish for bringing this about. But I'm also, and let's see here if I can, I can add an image to the whiteboard. Uh, that has to do with the database reliability engineering book. It has a horse on the cover. Uh, if you're interested in reading that book, I just got it for the Kindle, and it, it looks like uh, it's not coming through as one of the – here you go. Uh, it appears that even Brent Ozar, my friend Brent Ozar, has actually already read this book. Maybe he's got, <laughs> got a review of it too, but I do plan uh, on reading this for the Kindle as well, so we'll throw that in there. So that's the book on this. The other author of this is Lane Campbell. That's the name I couldn't remember there, the other author of that book. Uh, I just bought it on Amazon. So why do I think this is a good term? Uh, I think the term database administrator doesn't really mean that much anymore. Uh, the, the DBA term is wrong. So I think that the right out of the gate, I think database reliability engineering is a closer description of what a lot of DBAs do rather than database administrator. And that just has to do with explaining the job to people who don't do the job. Like, what does the term administrator really mean? Well, administrator kind of sounds like, right, a lot of people associate the term administrator with either a public administrator or a school administrator. An administrator, to me, really reminds me of people who set policies, but they aren't really involved with the action. 
You know, they are not in the class teaching the class. They are setting bigger policies and they're kind of removed from things and they may be out of the loop. (laughs) I think historically, also what the term database administrator for people who have worked in IT for a while, I I think it's equally misleading because the term administrator, what DBA is really used to do was, right, when I first started as a DBA, a, a large part of what the DBA did was installation. How do I actually install this off of floppy disks and then CDs and then DVDs, right? But actual install media and also configuration, right? Installation, configuration. But the configuration that DBAs did was largely like, I need to uh, set up backups for this, right? I need to allocate some storage for this. And a lot of what we have now, right now, installing SQL Server I mean, for development environments, I would just go, you know, use a chocolatey command and go Chaco install SQL Server to install the SQL Server version I want. Or maybe I'm installing it via a Docker image or all sorts of things that really shouldn't need a DBA anymore for non-production reasons. But even production installations, I mean, I was already setting up automated slipstream installations of SQL Server that could be run from the command line more than 10 years ago. I mean, well more than 10 years ago, because I didn't want to spend my time installing. I also didn't want to install my time configuring. I mean, now we not only have all these ways to automate installation, like chocolatey, like command line installs of other types, but we also have automated ways to configure. So we've got community tools like dbatools.io, tons of uh, PowerShell stuff there. And I wonder, I'm like, can I add a, a website in here? I don't know if I can do that to the the thing here, but we'll do uh, a Bing. Let's see if we can find something for dbatools.io. Um, here we go. We'll add a little PowerShell in there. And you can get just you know, tons of things that make your life easier that, yes, this is a little bit of a role. You know, the database specialist, who I've just been calling database specialists now, but like think about what they do. There's a small portion of consideration for configuration, but a lot of what you're thinking about in a DBA job now, when you're thinking about configuration, you think about how do I automate this, right? How is can this be done repeatedly without error from, you know, in an automated fashion? But with configuration, you really think about how do I configure this so it's the most reliable and most performant for what it's doing. Almost everything involved in configuration is more about reliability than it is about best practices. Um, Best practices, I would say, are another thing that's kind of going away, right? So configuration work, installation is becoming automated. Configuration is becoming automated. Best practices are either becoming like built in, right? Now, when you install SQL Server, it's like, hey, I'm going to figure out how many TempDB files are probably right for you. Like it's getting better at auto configuration. But also, there's fewer times when it's just straightforward of like, oh, you should always do X. It's kind of like, well, you should often do X, but sometimes it's Y, and then you really need to think about Z. (laughs) depending on this list of things. And so it is more about how do I use the settings that balance out performance and reliability? It's much more of a judgment call. And it is when you're doing, when you're think, doing the thinking part of this configuration, right? Not like running the script, but the thinking part of this is really about how do I do this effectively and reliably? And it almost always, like more, of it, more than ever... Uh, business continuity, and not in the sense business continuity is the wrong term because often business continuity is a reaction to a disaster. But it's it's really about RPO and RTO. And maybe that's why that picture of Brent Ozar holding this book came up because he thinks a lot about Brent of uh, RPO and RTO. How much data can I lose? And how much time can I be down? So that's kind of the essence behind uh, recovery point objective, recovery time objective. We have to engineer for that. 
what types of failover do I need for this, right? If I lose a single piece of hardware up to if I lose a data center, what happens and how does the workload react? That is a a very specialized part of the configuration. And it's all about balancing the need for the needs for reliability, for performance, and for cost and making that work in the best way possible. And as much as possible, we try to design it so the human doesn't have to constantly intervene. We try to make it as resilient as possible. So this is just like why I think that the DBA, the admi- administration doesn't really explain this very well. Not to someone who's not in IT. It doesn't explain it well to them. It doesn't explain it that well to people who have been IT for a while either. So what, I haven't read the book yet. I'm going to read the book and then I'm going to do another live stream. I thought it'd be fun to do one beforehand to then read the book and then do one afterwards about, okay, what do I think I was totally wrong about in the first one? But I do know some things already about site reliability engineering. And also I've read some articles about the book already. <laughs> so I did do a small amount of prep. Um, I'll, the One of the words that jumped out at me Uh, when I was reading a little bit about the book, is a word that I've actually been thinking about a lot in the last year from other contexts, the term guardrails. When thinking about reliability engineering, you want to not just think about, okay, what happens if an asteroid hits the data center, which could happen, right? (laughs) There's other things that are more likely that could possibly go wrong, but we have to think about uh, things like that. Uh, So it's not just thinking about what if something goes wrong, you know, um, but it's also thinking about how do we set things up by default so that things we are protected by default or things go right by default. And a lot of this is around, uh, so one example of guardrails that I think is just really worth thinking about in terms of databases, for example, is ensuring that we've got a way that people can efficiently set up environments outside of production, but they aren't just making a data breach more likely. So what is the tooling and the processes and the automation that we can adopt to make it so that we don't have people sitting around not being able to do anything because an environment is slow to rebuild? We want fast environments set up. We want it to be reliable, like, hey, you know, it doesn't just break every time we try it. But we also want to make it usable and make sure that we aren't just sharing around copies of production backups with, you know, vulnerable information in them and that we are protected by default. So that's a really, uh, that's an example of something that really does need guardrails. Someone really needs to take care of this. It's the person formerly known as the DBA, who I would say is more about database reliability engineering, right? But this stretches between kind of the worlds of the production DBA and the developer as well. And this is a key bit of database reliability engineering. The scope is beyond production. The scope, even if this is a platform group that is really focusing on the reliability of the production platform, the scope of database reliability engineering has to go beyond production either by partnering with groups who work on database reliability before code ever gets to production, right? Either by having a really strong partnership with someone who does this on the side of development or by taking the function and stretching it across that development function too because you, it's very rare that you can fully experiment only in the production environment. Now, when you can, so I'm actually a huge favor of testing in production whenever you can. Some database people just hear this and are like, testing in production, that's crazy. Well, it depends. I mean, it might, uh, if you can make testing in production as non-crazy as possible, then it's perfect. So one example, worked, uh, and this goes back years, right? This isn't new, been doing this for years. Uh, 20 years ago, I started working at an ad serving firm and we had multiple environments across multiple data centers. And we have the ability to control the flow of traffic through a variety of data centers and the ability to do experiments. So we could roll out new code and it could be tested against a small portion of the population in many versions of of 
or many um, aspects of our tooling. Not every aspect of our tooling had this, but a lot of things did. Where you could say, ah, oh, we're going to show, show this new code to a little bit, the target audience, see how it does. If it doesn't go well, we're going to pull it back, right? Oh, it looks like it's going well. We're going to send more traffic to that. So for both small and major releases, there was a variety of functionality where we could literally test it in production. And if things went bad, the impact wasn't that bad. It was fantastic. It was way better than lighting up things for the entire population at once. And the tendency to do this, the pattern of doing this, really grew in our organization. And it fed into the use of things like feature flags for a lot of code in our application so that we could separate the concepts of deploying from releasing. And this was actually a tip I picked up from, I love this differentiation. Donovan Brown of Microsoft is the one who uh, made this point in a conversation, and I just thought it was brilliant. He's like, yeah, so essentially, the it's important thing mentally to understand that making a code deployment shouldn't be the same as releasing functionality to users. If you separate those and you can deploy code in a state where it isn't just automatically effective, you get a lot more flexibility. Things go wrong, turn off, turn off the feature, which is often done by feature flags. Now, there is a culture behind getting into the mindset of doing this and working it into the planning. And there's also uh, adding feature flags. It does add technical overhead. So, uh, for example, Steve Jones and I were doing a conference. We were doing a day-long talk at the past summit. We had someone in the audience who mentioned that, yeah, we've got so many feature flags that it can be hard to know, oh, with that old flag on and this one off, like what? how do these combine? <laughs> Right? If you aren't always up on documenting your feature flags, removing old ones and making things really clear, you can get different kinds of problems. So there is actually software out there that can help you manage your feature flags, right? Because there is an element of complexity that comes into this. But I do think, however you manage this overall, absolutely uh, separating these concepts of deploying from releasing whenever you can is an important part of just software development today. And when thinking about how to do this when it comes to database changes is a key part of database reliability engineering. Another thing is just um, how the software development life cycle is and works. And the way I'm going to express this is treat database code as real code. <laughs> this is such an important thing. And I think it is inherent. Like, I mean, I could be talking about infrastructure as code, which I also think is important here. But when it comes to database reliability engineering, one of the, the core things that is a starting point for a lot of people is realizing that whether it's a schema change, you know, whether you're adding a column to a table, whether you're adding a new function, a new procedure, whether you're adding code, whether you're refactoring something, or even whether you are you know, having an application auto-generate the SQL that's run against a database, it is real code. <laughs> it isn't just something that should be changed in the production database. And anytime you need to know what it is, you just look in the production database. Like other code, you need to know, you need a way to find out when did this change and why? Like that should all be very clear, right? And if we aren't there yet, that's one of the baby steps that we should take to get there is treating database code as something that is tunable, that gets checked into source control, that has a known kind of established way of working its way through environments, and that can be and should be tested. Now, I know there is that, you know, old joke that Everyone has a development environment and some people are just lucky enough that it's different than production, right? <laughs> we should all be so lucky. Like literally, we should all be this lucky. And part of this change towards becoming a database reliability engineer is in moving things that way. The database reliability engineering team may not be writing all this code. And this is uh, one of the interesting things about site reliability engineering teams is that in terms of making them successful, a lot of this is about having, like if the site reliability engineering team, if they are taking handoffs of code deployments from a, a relatively separate deployment team, 
the site reliability engineering team, they have the ability to, uh, well, first of all, say, hey, that isn't ready for release. But they're empowered to, you know, test, improve, and deploy the code. And also, they're empowered to say when something doesn't meet standards and isn't deployable. It's not just this traditional one-way thing of we, you know, development throws the code over to the fence and that engineering team just has to make it work. In order to deal with reliably, this does need to be a two-way street. And this does help things like, as long as it's a two-way street, you need to establish partnerships on both sides of the street. Both teams need to be invested in not only the speed of deployment, but the health of the production system. You need to help visibility. I very much believe in things like that because this isn't just the DBA or you know the IT person is at the end of the line and they just have to deal with whatever gets flung over the wall and make it work. Uh, that we've already tried. <laughs> That we've been trying for years in software development, and I still haven't found folks who find it uh, to be very successful. So I am now going to go on. I'm going to go in and I'm going to read this book, which I, I just bought the ebook copy of this. So I'm really excited to dive into this O'Reilly book. Thanks to Lane Campbell and Charity Majors for writing this. And I will be back in a few weeks to talk a little bit about what I learned from the book and how my thinking on this has evolving. But I think it's worth thinking about if you are a DBA, like what is the future of your job? Are you going to see yourself more as a database reliability engineer? Or do you think your job will change in a different way? Do you think you'll become more of a developer? Do you think you'll become more of a business person over time? Because things definitely are changing, and I think in very positive ways personally. So thanks for joining me today for this live stream or live stream recording if you're watching this later. I'm Kendra from Redgate's Advocate Team. I'll see you again in another live stream soon. Bye, folks. <laughs>